Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, Chris Smith, and Jeff Villamek. On this episode of DTNS, Samsung's got smarts in its new Galaxy S24, but they're mostly Googles. Also, Amazon's got some more local sports, and you're not imagining it. Search is getting worse. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 17th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Jang. And joining us, Android developer and host of the Android Faithful podcast, Wen Tui Dao. Welcome back. Hey, good to be back, everybody. everybody. Happy Unpacked Day. Happy Unpacked Day. Do you feel unpacked? Very, very, just just mind, <laughs> just totally unpacked by everything I heard today. Yeah, a galaxy of unpackedness, and it's all AI, as far as you can see. Uh, we're going to talk about that and more. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, though, has just denied Apple's request to pause the ITC ban, so no Apple Watch Series 9 or Apple Watch Ultra 2s in the U.S. as of 5 p.m. Eastern, Thursday, January 18th. So hurry, get to the store. Let's start with the quick hits. <laughs> In other Apple news, the U.S. Supreme Court denied Apple's appeal in its ongoing legal battle with Epic Games. We talked about that on yesterday's show. Now, Apple announced changes are coming to its App Store guidelines to comply. The company previously prohibited developers from linking to alternate payment systems within their apps. Now they can, as long as the app also offers purchases through Apple's own in-app purchase system. The new guidelines also say that devs can apply for an entitlement to include buttons or links directing users to out-of-app purchases mechanisms in the U.S.-based iOS or iPad OS app store. Apple will also now charge a 12% commission on purchases made through alternative payment platforms for members of the App Store small business program, 27% for other apps. This applies to purchases made within seven days after a user taps on an external purchase link and continues from the system disclosure sheet to an external website. Those are Apple's own words. Devs need to provide accounting of qualifying out-of-app purchases and remit the appropriate commissions with Apple also having auditing rights. But Epic is not giving up here. Tim Sweeney called the new guidelines bad faith compliance. So Sweeney says he's headed back to district court to contest the implementation. Now, when uh, I, I know you're an Android developer uh, mostly, but a- as a developer, um, just, just real quick, h- how do these guidelines sound to you? Oh, they sound awful. Um, I mean, it's it's always a weird thing between like user experience and then like what's good for business and how they either align or don't align. And so, yes, like nominally, like having a user, uh, having developers in, entitled to kick out to the web is a good thing for them. Is it a good thing for users? I mean, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of with Sweeney here. It a little, feels a little they did what the least that they possibly could and they probably need to be taken out back and talked to again. So it's my <laughs> opinion. A stern talking to. Stern talking to. <laughs> uh, well, in other Apple news, pre-orders for the Apple Vision Pro headset open uh, on Friday, January 19th. Publications who got to test the headset early have posted some initial reviews. And Gadget's Dana Woolman and Sherilyn Lowe both said they initially had issues getting it to fit right, but with various strap and tighten- tightening options, they got there. Although the weight did become a factor with prolonged use. They're not the only ones to say that. A lot of people say it does start to feel heavy. Uh, Lowe also liked the floating keyboard experience. The Woolman thought it was lackluster for extended use. Both said they thought the Vision Pro was the best of breed in VR experiences so far, noting that the price tag, of course, is a sticking point. 9to5Mac notes that the official FCC filings say the Vision Pro does not support ultra-wideband. Uh, it does not support Wi-Fi 6E or even Wi-Fi 7 uh, due to the hardware being developed around the M2 chip. Apple Vision Pro will ship with Wi-Fi 6 support, not 6E. Uh, Apple uses UWB, ultra-wideband, inside it's air tags iphones and apple watches so don't lose your apple vision pro whatsapp is expanding its channels feature to include voice updates and polls and additional admins channel owners can now use voice updates to their followers and whatsapp notes that its two billion user base sends seven billion voice messages daily so this is something that a lot of people are probably going to use channel updates can now also be shared to a personal whatsapp status as well 
Google agreed to pay $5 billion to me. Ah, no, it's not to me. It's to settle a lawsuit from 2020 over how it tracked users' activity in Chrome incognito mode and is now updating the mode disclaimer to reflect its data collection practices. Uh, that's now live in the Canary version of Chrome on Android, if you just can't wait to see it. Uh, it's also in the Canary version of Chrome on Windows and other platforms, which MS Power user noted. The new DJI Mic 2 is a 2.4 gigahertz wireless audio set that offers two transmitters, one receiver, and a metal charging case, announced on Wednesday. Each transmitter has 8 gigabits, uh, gigabytes rather, of built-in storage and offers up to 32-bit float audio recording or 24-bit with a minus 6 decibel safety track. Transmitters can connect directly to phones or other DJI cameras using Bluetooth. The receiver also works with USB-C and lightning adapters or a 3.5 mm analog output cable $349 for the whole rig that's a nice little mic now over to Sarah with sports oh Amazon is leaning further into sports Tom the company is investing in Diamond Sports Diamond Sports is the autonomous subsidiary of Sinclair that operates 18 regional sports networks under the Bally Sports banner those networks broadcast games for 37 teams uh, 11 of those uh, MLB 15 in the NBA and 11 NHL when approved by the bankruptcy court, Amazon became a minority investor, so it gets the rights to add Bally Sports Net content to Prime Video, while the content will also remain on cable channels. So if you're watching it another way and you've got cable, you're probably good. Amazon will also be involved in negotiations with the NHL, the NAB, and the MLB to keep rights for future seasons. Not the NAB, <laughs> the National Association of Broadcasters. Is not. I said, uh, it's a, what did I say? NAB? <laughs> I think you accidentally might have said NAB. Oh, okay. man. Ah, <laughs> you know. uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the deal here is interesting. Uh, I would like to see Amazon buy Diamond. Di Diamond is essentially a different company than Sinclair. It's it's kind of a weird situation where they they separated themselves. They're coming out of bankruptcy court. Amazon is giving them the money to make it out of bankruptcy court, but they still have to negotiate all their deals with the Major League Baseball teams. Their NBA and NHL deals will expire at the end of the seasons that those two leagues are in right now. So nothing's guaranteed for the future, which might be why Amazon doesn't want to buy them yet. They want to kind of negotiate these new deals first before they go in further. Because otherwise, I, I would imagine Amazon would just like to buy this up. And if they bought it up, that could mean no more blackouts. If you're in a Bally Sports region, that could mean that all these teams would be available nationwide because Amazon wouldn't care if cable companies get mad or not. As it is, being a minority investor, they're just getting a sweetheart deal to add Bally to Prime Video, which gives them an advantage because YouTube uh, lost their deal with Bally. Uh, I don't think Hulu has most of the Bally sports, if any. Uh, and uh, DirecTV Now, I think, is the only streaming outlet that I know has a locked up deal with Bally. So it would be interesting to see uh, what happens in the future. For now, it just means if you have one of these sports nets covering one of your favorite teams, you're going to get an option to stream it that's easier than going all the way to DirecTV Now or something else. I mean, hey, choice is good. When uh, does any of this move the needle for you? Uh, I'm, I just want to see how it shakes out. I mean, I, I've, I, we've spent all most of last week making fun of the, you know, Peacock, uh, Peacock exclusive NB, or sorry, and which, which, what a, which end for the NFL, N NFL mm -hmm. game. So I'm kind of just <laughs> curious how this will all shake out in the end and how our viewing choices will hopefully broaden and not like narrow, but it's just kind of funny to see like all these kind of inroads into like broadcast sports happen. So I don't know. Well, and oh, you know, Eve, for all of the sort of chuckling about Peacock, uh, very, uh, well part participated uh, a yeah. lot of Highest people signed rated, up for peacock yeah a huge huge high, highly rated event um and 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 granted uh annoying uh but but people did it i i think this is this is one of the small milestones along the way to all of sports being available on streaming at some point uh Di diamond is one of the thorniest of these and I kind of feel like once this gets resolved one way or the other, either Diamond gets sold or all the rights go back to the leagues and it gets liquidated. Uh, my guess is Major League Baseball wouldn't mind absorbing it and getting all the rights back or Amazon ends up buying it and bringing all the regional sports onto Prime Video. But whatever happens is going to happen in the next year or so. Uh, and then then we're going to see that set the template for how sports streams in the future, I think. Mm hmm.
404 Media reports that scientists at Leipzig University, Bauhaus University Weimar, and the Center for Scalable Data Analytics and Artificial Intelligence conducted a year-long study of Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo's product review search quality. That's the first thing. This is just looking at product reviews, searching for product reviews, not search in general. They monitored results for 7,392 product review terms on those three search engines, DuckDuckGo, Bing, and Google. That's the other thing that's missing in the headlines is you only see Google in the headlines. This is about all three. And they found that while a small portion of product review websites use affiliate marketing, the majority of search results did. So you're not seeing a representative sample of product review websites when you do a search. They also found the evidence of the continual back and forth between spammy sites that game the search ranking engines and search engines changing the ranking system to remove the spammy sites out of the top spots. Uh, in fact, the study showed that of these three search engines, who do, who do you think did best? It was Google. Google did better than Bing and DuckDuckGo at this back and forth. But spam sites have the upper hand in all cases. They expect generative models to benefit spammy sites in this even more as, as AI becomes more prolific. Now, this study was limited to product reviews, but it's an indication of the general decline of search engine usefulness in the face of increasingly sophisticated manipulation by sites. And it's not specific to Google. It, it happens across the board. Uh, I, I feel like this is the death knell for search, when. Yeah, I mean, that's just like the thing is like, it's so funny to, to think that, you know, um, a large, big, huge conglomeration that's been doing this for what, how long has Google, been, like Google search been around like almost 30, 90s. Is it? Yeah, 90, yeah, 30, 30 years, even with all their research, even while their AI have your drink, if you're playing that drinking game, you shouldn't though, is that it, <laughs> <laughs> you'll get wasted. Yeah, don't it, there, there's something to be said about the power of a big, massive, you know, network machine learning empowered entity, and then just a lot of really hardworking SEO people trying to circumvent your, um, I don't know, like your good works. Um, and it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's it, just like anything else. It's at some point scale does not work and being able to address like the day-to-day -day issues or the day-to-day -day, day -day bad actors just becomes impossible. It's a scale issue. Although it, it is kind of also like the opposite where I guess suppose like Google, because it's a little more resilient, might do, in fact, better than Bing and DuckDuckGo, since I know DuckDuckGo, for example, is less like uh, established and probably has less of the fancy bells and jingles AI mm. that Google has. But yeah, it's uh, it's a tough world out there. We've had a long time to not just use Google search, but, uh, you know, hack it and circumvent it and make it do our SEO bidding. I not mean, me Google, personally. But. Google search is... is my search of choice. Um, uh, I am currently in the market for a new television. So, you know, when I have a few minutes here and there, you know, I type things like OLED, Sony, 65 inch TV, uh, you know, living room, pics, all sorts of stuff like that. I don't find spammy sites to really come to the top of product results. Maybe it's because I'm just so used to it. I just ignore certain things because I'm. I was going to say, yeah, you're I'm. I'm, just, I'm yeah. used to being like, yourself. I kind of know where I'm going, yeah, you yeah. know, in the product review type thing. And yeah, maybe that's just I have filtered out certain things, and maybe I fall victim to those things, and I don't realize that either. But um, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you that over the last five years, say my my product review uh, search experience has gotten significantly worse, but. It probably also depends a lot on what you're searching for. I don't know. I, I, I think it's gotten worse personally. I think it's gotten worse. Yeah. I actually, um, I'm on my uh, brother in law and sister's house, and he actually specifically uh, has some kind of special filtering for uh, spam and like kind of like ad sites. And I have to scroll really, really, really far, far down to find an actual site that I can go to. And it just feels like, yeah, I, I do think there's some kind of like, um, kind of uh, 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 in, in, in inuring or just getting used to what a spam mm -hmm. site looks like, and kind of like almost like a, a a kind of warping of reality of what we perceive, we perceive to be spam and what versus like you know you know good honest advertising. Um, I I just feel like my perception is warped just because of how you know this whole ecosystem and this whole market has evolved. So. I don't know. I'm also very susceptible to Instagram ads, so you know, that's just me. <laughs> Which I think is even worse, yeah. Because I'm with you, Sarah. It's not that search is useless, uh, but it, it's not it's not as useful as I would have thought it would be by now. Google's big innovation in the 90s, in the late 90s when it came along, was, oh my gosh, these results are what I'm looking for. 
Uh, and they've continued to fight the good fight to keep it that way. But I, I regularly find myself going, you know what, I'm just going to go straight to a website because I, I can't find what I'm looking here. And, but I know the wire cutter I mean, or the spruce mm-hmm. or even somebody you, has even, what I need. Even if you click on you, the product tab up at the top, I mean, that's the first thing you I mean do. the shopping tab? Yeah, yeah. If you want I mean, to, if you're looking to buy something. No, uh, that's after I've decided to buy something. When I'm looking for reviews and recommendations, yeah, then, yep, yep, yep. then yeah. it's a different story. Well, but even then it's like, okay, I spent a lot of time at bestbuy.com as of late. And, you know, all of those reviews are, you know, grain, grains of salt, right? Oh, yeah, I, go, no, eh, I, I, I mean, those. maybe that was I, a real person. I'm but looking maybe for it was just the spruce. Robot. I'm looking for Sweet Home yeah. or the wire cutter, maybe PC Mag, CNET, et cetera, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, but I'm going straight there. Um, I and then yes, once I've found it, I might go back and use the Google Shopping Engine as one of my sites to be like, okay, where can I find the best price? But yeah, I I it's uh, if you you too have said, I don't know, is it me or, or search engine results uh, not as good as they used to? This indicates maybe maybe they're not. Yeah, it's not just you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you have a thought about something on the show, but you don't know our email address, well, here it is. Email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Samsung held its unpacked event in San Jose this morning uh, in California, where the company announced three new phones and their AI powered services and features. Sarah's going to run down the important specs so we don't get too held up in all the specs. What, what's the important stuff, Sarah? Okay, so first up, we've got the flagship Galaxy S24 Ultra. It comes with a new titanium finish, 6.8 inch of 120 hertz, 1440p display, 50 megapixel camera with 5x zoom, and a Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 chip starting at $1,299. Uh, the Galaxy S24 Plus. Comes with a 6.7 inch screen, similar to the Ultra. Also has the same front camera as the Ultra, featuring 12 gigabytes of RAM. 12 gigabytes of RAM? It's gotta be more than that. It also starts at $999.99. And the S24 has a 6.2 inch display, 8 gigs of RAM, and starts at $800. Both with S24 and S24 Plus uh, having those aluminum frames. All three ship on January 31st. When, which one are you getting? Um, probably the S24 regular. Was it regular? Like unleaded? <laughs> the, un- the, the, un- the, the non, the yeah. non-ultra one. The I, non-plus, I, the non-ultra. The non-plus, the non-ultra. Just, uh-huh. It's a regular old phone. Um, nothing too large. I, 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 I don't know. I feel like I'm in the minority, especially among like Android fans. I don't want a tall phone. I want like something that actually, you know, fits in my hand without me having to stretch my thumb. Uh, and I always like kind of seeing what a lower high we're we're trying to there's like this new segment appearing where it's like the lower of the premium phones Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and i feel like the s24 system that's a lower premium i I feel like there's going to be there's this expanding market of lower premium mid it's not even mid it's like low premium and i want to kind of see what the s24 that 800 dollar price point right yeah that that basically the 800 dollars price point so we'll we'll see i want to i want to get that s24 well, and the nice thing about it is these models are not that different than the S23. They're yeah. a little brighter. They're a little bigger in their screen because they they removed the bezel. But the differentiator works on all three of them uh, because the differentiator is the software. Uh, one of the key features is what they call Galaxy AI. Uh, but that means everything. Uh, users can access the Google Gemini models through Samsung apps and services, uh, same way that you can on Pixel. So the Gemini Pro is going to power Samsung Notes, voice recorder, and keyboard apps. For for example, the voice recorder can do a summary. Uh, You can ask uh, Google Gemini Pro to summarize what you recorded. And then Gemini Nano, which is the on-device model, the one where you don't need to be in the cloud. Gemini Pro, you got to go to the cloud, so you're giving some data to Google. Gemini Nano, you don't. Uh, That will enable Google Messages including Magic Compose, uh, which uh, I think Samsung calls tone selection. Uh, That one you don't need an internet connection for. And that will be able to let you choose a tone in which to compose a message. So you want to be excited, you want to be professional, et cetera. Uh, Also, Google announced Circle to Search, 
So this is coming to the Pixel 8s and the new S24s. Users can draw a circle over or tap parts of the screen that you want to search. So you, you either long press on the home button or or that, uh, that tab, uh, that navigation tab, and then you can just circle something and results are, printed, are presented on top of the existing screen or app. Also live translation, which, which isn't new, that was demonstrated before by Google, but that's coming as well. Real-time uh, language translation of 13 different languages on the phone. Each person would hear a translated version into their preferred language, uh, including other person on a conversation, uh, not needing an Android phone. They could be on a landline. So it'll, it'll that is send, cool. yeah, yeah. It'll send it back and forth and handle it on your phone's end. Uh, so you've picked your form factor now when, uh, there's a few other things that it does here that we can get through, but, but do any of these excite you? I, I, I'm just having a lot of deja vu this morning during Galaxy Unpack because I feel like a lot of these features either exist already on Pixel or are a repackaging of things that we've heard at Google IO before. And I mean, not to, and this is not to kind of take away the value or the impressiveness and also kind of like the probably upgrade that everything has had from Gemini. But like live translation, as he said, we've, you know, Pixel has demonstrated something like that. Even Magic Compose. And it's kind of weird because at some point I was watching and I was like, I, waiter, I have some Google in my Samsung unpacked. Like it just, it, it was really hard to tell it's at what point Google kind of left off and Samsung began. They even had like Hiroshi Lockheimer yeah. and a few other like Google execs on stage. And it was weird at times, especially when they would run through other, you know, like things like Magic Compose, again, which was announced last year at I.O. or even talk about Android Auto. It, it's a really, I don't know, because I feel like I already have this stuff, but they're just like repackaging it for me. I mean, it's, it is really hard to tell what exactly Galaxy AI is, either in addition to or in lieu of or in the same space as any kind of Pixel exclusive feature. I mean, maybe that's just it. Maybe it's like Google Pixel exclusive features. And then also your Galaxy AI. And I mean, like most of these things I think are really interesting. Um, I do think that the the really the the thing that's, that that this new kind of generation of generative AI I think is the most fascinating is summarization and organization and being able to just distill things for you. So I think it's like note assist and then like the summarization of the recorder, mm -hmm. which also, by the way, a pixel recorder uh, feature where you can summarize and also detect like, you know, different speakers and label them. Um, I think all that is, is super fascinating, of course, live translation for, you know, communication. So I think all that is super interesting. It's just like, it was really confusing because I feel like yeah. I've heard all this all before. Uh, yeah. And I don't know where, why is it, what's Galaxy AI and how is it different? Because Gemini is in there. So. I don't think it's different. I, I th there, it's there's differences different, in that but... some of the Pixel 8 Pro stuff works locally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas on the Galaxy AI, it works in the cloud. Uh, I noticed that. Uh, and yeah, there, there's a few features here and there that differentiate it, but largely I, my impression was if you like Samsung style, which, which is, is a thing, a lot of people like it, uh, or if you like Samsung's universe and, and you want to get, uh, you know, the, the Samsung galaxy watch and, and you like the, the Samsung app store and the Samsung native apps. And especially if you're in Korea and, and, and everything works with Samsung, uh, then this is a great phone because it's going to, you're not going to be behind on features. You're not going to look at the pixel and think, gosh, I wish I had that. Cause you're going to have everything, but there's not a reason to get a Samsung galaxy S 24 if you don't like Samsung stuff, mm -hmm. there's not like, well, I have to get it anyway because, right? That that's what I was not seeing. Yeah, and I, I, I think it is weird because yesterday, um, on Android Faithful, yesterday we covered a one story where basically Google is shuttering a lot of Google Assistant features, and I, it, it really feels like you know, and, and we also another story is that Samsung is no longer the number one smartphone manufacturer in the world. Right. It's now Apple. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Samsung, of course, in the Android sphere or in the non-Apple sphere, is still number one. But it, it feels like Google, there's like this dramatic shift in how Google is approaching the entire smartphone ecosystem and, and its role as the AI provider. I think so. For, so for so for so many years, it's like Google is the platform, and it kind of was like a north star. And like, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that you can do with our technology, and here's our phones to showcase it. And it, there's like a muddled, you know, distinction between like being a platform leader and example and also just being a business and we get to sell phones and how, who's going to who's going to pay for all these people working on these, uh, you know, assistant and other features. And it feels like a big shift to, OK, we only have four percent of the market share in Pixel. No one's really picking up any of these really, really cool demos that we show year after year. How do we get people to pick things mm -hmm. up? And I think it makes sense to and, and, and to what I just saw today was basically, OK, Google's like, all right. 
four percent is four percent samsung if we actually want this ai business this ai these ai features to be noticed to be picked up and to be kind of like part of like the average consumer and not like those of us here in the tech space who are savvy and who are super fans average people to be able to notice this we need to get and and kind of put it more forward in a samsung shell um and that's yeah. what i was getting is that it's just a big shift to okay google and samsung we tight we're doing this thing together and that's that's really what i thought of it just like okay they're going to kind of focus on partners instead of just being this you know th this like golden example that you know other android oh yeah well, that, and that's google more of a had... microsoft model isn't it <laughs> Google had uh, to um, about uh, Android Faithful talking about some assistant um, features kind of winding down because Google said they just were underutilized. Yeah. I wonder, you know, how many of the people who knew what the options were said, eh, just don't need to do it. And how many people just don't know how to do it? I, I have, think have, yeah. Have not been sort of like walked through. This is how this makes your life so much easier. And I think a lot of assistants, I'm not just talking about Google Assistant, mm -hmm. assistants in general, you hear a lot of just sort of like, yeah, with AI, all the companies have to reimagine all this stuff. That is definitely true to some extent. But there are, <laughs> when I, when I uh, watch a, 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 an event like Unpacked and I'm kind of like, okay, cool, AI, got it. That's the buzzword. All right, mm -hmm. what are we doing? What am All I right. doing? What am I doing with this? Sometimes I feel like sort of like looking for product reviews on search engines. I'm like, huh. I just need good places to show me the, you know, the, the cool tricks. And we're still in those early days of, of companies being like, well, nobody's using that. But it's like, well, maybe I would if I understood it better. Yeah, hundred percent. Discoverability of features is the seminal problem in application development and doing cool stuff. And I think, regardless of any pro, like any any software product I've ever worked on, it doesn't matter how cool your idea is or how much it could empower people, how much productivity they can get out of it. If they can't find it, they don't know how it works. It's 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 DOA. And I think that's like a hundred percent, Sarah. On, you, you have to hit the nail on the head. Is that Google's cranking out all this stuff. Some of it's half baked, and, and the other half people can't find it. So I, yeah, and I, I just think, hey, give it to Samsung, and they'll, you know, do their hello fellow kids marketing yeah, and let yeah. people know, <laughs> look at all the stuff that you can do uh, with us. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's just a, a, a hail mary to do the sports. Well, because I'm looking at this stuff, and in, in, and in the in today, right, generative photo edit, ma magic editor, yeah. uh, edit images by long pressing or circling objects in a photo. This this was all. All, uh, impressive stuff. Will people remember if they saw it or if they never watched this keynote and they buy a galaxy, will they know to use it? Uh, that, that, that's a, that's a big question. Transcript assist, you know, the, the translating stuff that we're talking about over the phone. Um, I think sometimes people don't use it because they're like, yeah, it's a great demo, but I don't really need this in my regular life. Uh, but you're right. Sometimes they don't use it because they don't know it's there. No, I think that's also really fair too. Like, I think um, even things like, you know, pixel features like best take where, you know, if you have a bunch of adjacent pictures and you get to p take your best, you know, mm -hmm. the faces from the best ones and stick them together and create a composite where everyone's looking perfectly at the camera. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there is like a gap also in kind of connecting to a user case, especially as like a lay person that doesn't want to go and like experiment all the things and doesn't pay attention. I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing in technology is when, when you innovate, you there, there's like a part of it where you're trying to respond to a need that you see and then part of it has to be imagining what people could use it for yeah that they and don't then, know they want and right. that yeah they don't know that they want and sometimes you're right uh and sometimes you're wrong and then sometimes there's just a weird disconnect where it there's a possibility out there where this feature is like used by like half half of the world but you're not able to cut, you know, do the, the, the 10 things in that particular variant of the multiverse that actually connected people to that thing. It's, it's really weird. I think sometimes even luck but about something hitting the zeitgeist in the right way. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just what everyone is doing right now. AI is a zeitgeist. There are a bunch of darts out there and maybe something will hit with someone uh, and help us sell some more S 24s. Who knows? I think if you can't make the feature work in a product placement shot in a K drama that's on Netflix, then it's not a good feature. It's not going to catch on. That that's is really test. fair. I think that's a good yeah. test, especially for Samsung. Yeah, exactly. Specifically for, for, Specifically for Samsung. Samsung. All right, let's check out the mailbag. 
Uh, Kevin had a thought. Uh, he posted on Patreon about our conversation yesterday about AI and job cuts. Kevin says AI and those 5% job cuts were also about labor shortages currently. We oh, work in point. civil engineering and have trouble finding staff a lot lately. If we can free up segments of the workforce to fill other roles as we replace some with AI, it might benefit the workforce strains. Granted, education and location play into it, and if cut workers can retrain, et cetera. But it was a good thought experiment on other benefits of AI impacting jobs. Oh, Kevin, that's a great uh, that's a great point. A lot of those uh, industries that were not predicting job losses from AI also have job shortages versus the ones that were saying, yeah, we might have to eliminate some jobs uh, are not the ones with, with shortages. Although then you had ones like construction that, you know, uh, there's, it's, it's kind of in the middle. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's good stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Craig says he listened to yesterday's show and we were talking about the Apple vision pro and it gave him two thoughts. Uh, one, I want to use the vision pro video just like I do with other monitors or TV in my living room. I want another screen to the side when I'm working on other things. To me, this is awesome. And in very little space thoughts. Uh, if you mean, can you see your regular screens and do a screen to the side in the vision pro? That's interesting. Uh, or if you mean like, I just want to have multiple screens virtual, uh, I think you could probably do that. that th those are both interesting. And Craig also says, I'm already anticipating sharing the Vision Pro with my wife, but she needs readers for things close to her face. Will she be able to use it? Yes, you can get those. You have to pay for it, but you can get those uh, lens inserts for readers. And you don't even need a prescription for that. You only need your medical prescription if you want to get prescription lenses. They have reader uh, insert lenses as well. And they're a little less expensive than the prescription ones, I think. Well, thanks, Craig. And also thanks, Kevin, for writing in. And thanks to everybody who sends us feedback every day. Also, thanks to you, Wen Tui Dao. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Yeah, so if you want to continue to listen to me and also my co-host, Michelle Ramon, Jason Howell, and Ron Richards keep talking about Android things, you can be right here on the same stream every Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific for the Android Faithful podcast. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Samsung also announced a smart ring. Well, they kind of announced it. Uh, we're we're going to talk about that <laughs> and probably more of our thoughts on Unpacked. Stick around. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday. We record live at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow. Asking if the end of podcasting is nigh. We again. keep asking ourselves that. But we'll keep podcasting about it. Justin Robert Young joining us. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>